Hello, and welcome to part three in our study on Is Peter the First Pope of the Roman Catholic Church? We're going to pick right up now with point number five. Uh, if you've not seen the first two uh, lessons, I would ask that you go back and see them because they are consecutive. We're building one point upon another. So let's pick right up now with number five, looking at the proper interpretation of who is the foundation of the church. Is it Peter? and a succession of men, or is the foundation Jesus Christ? Number five, Peter never considered himself to be a pope or the head of the church. Peter never considered himself to be the head, the pope or the head of the church. Here's the position that the Second Vatican Council gives uh, on, what the, on who the pope is. Second Vatican Council, let me read for you. Dogmatic Constitution of the Church, Chapter 3, Section 22, if you care to look it up and read it for yourself. I quote, But the college or body of bishops has no authority unless it is understood together with the Roman pontiff, the successor of Peter, as its head. The Pope's power of primacy over all, both pastors and faithful, remains whole and intact in virtue of his office. That is, as the vicar of Christ and pastor of the whole church, the Roman pontiff has full, supreme, and universal power over the church, and he is always free to exercise this power. End of quote. So what are we seeing here? The position of the Pope as given by the Second Vatican Council. The pontiff has authority over all of the church, over all of the cardinals, the bishops, the priests, the laity. The Pope is the head of the church. They're declaring here he is the head. The Pope has the power of primacy over everyone. He is the vicar of Christ. The word vicar means instead of, in place of. He is the representative of Jesus Christ here on earth. It is his position here on Christ on earth that is the same as Christ. It's as, it is as if Jesus Christ was here himself, not deity or anything like that, but as far as representing and leading and guiding the church. He is the vicar of Christ. He has the same authority as Christ has. He is the pastor of the whole church, and he has full, supreme, universal power over that church and he is always free to exercise that power. Now, that's what the Second Vatican Council says. Let's see how Peter and the other apostles in Scripture, how they viewed this, how they viewed Peter, and how they viewed themselves. Number one, Peter never claimed a higher position. He never claimed to have a higher position than the other apostles. He always referred to himself as a fellow elder. He either spoke of himself as an apostle or as a fellow elder. 1 Peter 5.1 The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Secondly, Peter refused homage when he went to the house of Cornelius, Acts 10, verses 25 through 26. Again, we're looking at Peter never saw himself as superior or as the Pope. Acts 10, 25 through 26. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. Now, do you see what's happening here? See, and as we look at this point and the other point, I'm not saying that any one of these points all by themselves prove St. Peter's not the Pope. Um, I, I think each point is very strong, but the idea here is, too, is you start to put all of these points together. You put all these pieces together in a puzzle. What's the kind of picture that comes out at the end? So you have Peter seeing himself as an apostle and as a fellow elder. Now here, as he walks into the room, Cornelius sees, you know, the apostle Peter coming in and he gets down on his knees. And Peter says, mm -mm 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 -mm. stand up on your feet, which is a great thing for him to say. I am a man just like you. How does that go with the Roman pontiffs down through history? 
that when you come before, even up to today, that you come before the, the Roman pontiff, you bow before him, you go down to one knee, he puts out his hand, you kiss his ring. There's all of this genuflecting in this. Peter never saw himself like that. Peter never put himself in that position. And not only didn't he put himself in that position, he rebuked it when it happened. Because he said, I am a man just like you. Stand up on your feet. Good move, Peter. Number three, Peter instructed his fellow elders not to lord it over the flock. Again, not having this superior position. 1 Peter 5, 2 through 3. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Again, there's no higher position here. There's no superiority. I have this and you're that and I just... And we're not just talking humility of heart, that you need to be humble. We, you do need to be humble and that's, they're speaking about that there. But there's no big exalted positions here. We're all fellow laborers. We're, we're brothers and sisters in Christ here. Again, put the little pieces together. Number four. Peter never taught specifically that he was the Pope, or never taught that he was the Pope specifically. We saw that he, he said he was a fellow elder and apostle, but he never writes in any of his writings, in anything that he writes anywhere in the New Testament, whether it's in the book of Acts, or whether it's, it's in the first and second epi epistle of Peter's. He never says that he is the Pope that he is the supreme pontiff, that he is the head of the church, that he is the one that Christ is building his church upon. Especially, he always, Peter describes himself as an apostle and as an elder, but never as the supreme pontiff. And I bring up Acts because in Acts, that's where you have the churches being formed. If you've got a new structure going on here and a new form and a new, new hierarchy, and a new foundation that Jesus Christ is laying out, well, that's the place where you're going to deliver it. That's the place where you're going to make it plain. You're going to make sure people understand it. He never... And what do you think? I mean, the Pope. The Pope. The Pope is the head guy. As far as the church teaches today. You understand how I'm speaking here. He is the Pope, and everything descends from there. It is the supreme position. Don't you think that he would have made that crystal clear, that he would have spelled it out, A, B, C, here's, here's how Jesus told me that this thing works. He says, not only does it spell it out crystal clear, he says nothing, nothing, zero, zip, nada, nothing about his position as the Pope. He never mentions the papacy itself in any of his writings. It's just, I mean, the argument from silence is deafening. It's astounding. All right, number six, Peter never taught of a papal succession. And I guess I could say offhandedly, if there was no pope, why would he teach about it? But I think that's a very good point to ask, a good question to ask. If he was the first pope, if the apostles were the first pope, all of them lined up as the this, as this superior heads up there. Why didn't they teach how the succession would take place? If it's supposed to go from Peter all the way down to Pope Francis today, who sits in the chair of Peter all through these 2,000 years, over 2,000 years, why didn't they teach of how this is supposed to be passed down? He never does it. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 14, beginning at verse 14, Peter is getting ready to die. He's near death. He knows he's getting ready to go home and be with the Lord. So what does he say? For Second Peter 1, beginning at verse 14. Here's what Peter talks about. Chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, he reminds them of who Jesus Christ is. That's good. That's the first thing he talks about. Secondly, he tells them that Scripture came from the Holy Spirit. Chapter 1, 19 and 20. He's reminding them who Jesus Christ is. He's reminding them where the scriptures came from, that they come through the Holy Spirit. Now through the rest of it, chapter 2, verse 1 through chapter 3, verse 3, he warns them against false teachers that will come. 
He tells them who Jesus Christ is, where the Holy Scriptures came, and now he says, look out, because false teachers are going to be coming. Here's what he closes with, 2 Peter 3, 17 and 18. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory now and forever. Amen. Now, the point here that I'm making is if there was ever a time to explain papal succession and how when Peter dies, who's going to take over for him and how you choose they're going to do it, this is it. This is the time to explain it. If he's not explained it before, which he hasn't, it's nowhere else. He's giving, he's delivering his last message. And his last statement is, is beware of the false teachers that are coming. He says nothing, nothing at all about any type of papal succession and how it should be done. The only time you see anything going on in scriptures was when they met together in Acts chapter 1. I believe it's around verse 15, is where they had to replace an apostle because of Judas. They had to pick an apostle to replace Judas. And this is the only time you see this happen. They're not picking a new pope. They're not, pick, they're not setting up a chain of succession. It's just simply Judas and all of who Judas was and what happened with him. We need to replace Judas. And they got together. It says it was like about Peter was there and about 120 people. And they got together and they prayed and they, and they put two names out there and then they cast lots and Matthias was picked. It's the only thing you see about anyone being replaced. Paul comes later on as an apostle. It's a whole different thing. There's no appointing. There's no let's have a meeting. Let's have a council. Let's have this. Let's have that. Paul was handpicked by Jesus Christ himself. He meets him on the road to Damascus and you're it, Paul. That's what you see happening. So nowhere, anywhere, Peter never saw himself as anything. With all these points we just put here, Peter never saw himself as anything more than an apostle, an elder, a humble servant. Now, next one, six. How did the other apostles regard Peter? What did they think of him? How did they view him? Well, let's start with number one here. One, the mother of James and John. The mother of James and John goes and asks for her sons. She goes to Jesus Christ and she asks that her sons, one be seated on the right and one be seated on the left. When Jesus is in his kingdom. Matthew 20, verses 20 through 27. Let me read the verse for you. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And Jesus said to her, what do you wish? What do you want? What do you want to ask me? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. Now, first question. And again, here's little pieces of the puzzle. First question. If Peter is the Pope, if Peter is the supreme pontiff, if Peter is the leader among them and has the prime, prime position, why would she ask such a thing? That would be an insult to Peter. Or why wouldn't she ask just for one of them? Why would not the assumption be, well, I know Peter's at your right hand, uh, but here's my, one of my other sons. Can you pick one of them to be at the other side? No, she takes both sides. It's like there's no understanding or conception whatsoever of Peter having a primary position. And we read in verse 24, all of the other apostles, including Peter, weren't too happy with this. Verse 24 says, and when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. What are you doing? So we move on here. And what happens? Jesus rebukes them for their desire of superiority. For the desire of the primary prime positions. He rebukes all of them. Verse 25 through 28. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever desires to become great among you, let him be your minister. And whoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. 
Don't be looking for the superior position, he's saying. Be humble and be a servant. Apparently, maybe they got the message there, but they forgot again. On the very night that Christ is getting ready, to, he's going to be tried and crucified, we see the 12 apostles doing it again. Now, the, they're all arguing amongst themselves of who's going to be the greatest. Luke 22, verses 24 through 26. And now was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Or the greater among you is what that means. And he said to them, he gives them the same answer here. They're arguing with themselves. Who's going to be number one? Who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to be the top? Well, again, the point comes in, if Peter's already the Pope, the argument becomes moot. What are they talking about? The mere fact that they would do it shows that Peter is not the Pope, that he's not the head, he's not the supreme pontiff, he's not the leader of the group, he's not the greatest among them. And the Lord answers, and he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles, again, exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. It's not the way I set it up with you guys. And I don't want you guys to be thinking this way. You shouldn't be looking at who's the greatest, who's at the top, who's next, who's at the right hand, who's at the left hand. But not so among you. On the contrary, the opposite of what you're thinking. He who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. The younger in those days were the ones least respected. Okay, If you were older, you had more respect. It's not a disrespect, but you're new, you're young, you're wet behind the ears, you just learn what's going on. So he's saying, be, be like them. Don't be looking for the highest level of respect. And he who governs as he who serves. So again, I repeat, if Peter was the Pope, all of these questions are moot. The mother should have never asked it. The disciples shouldn't ask it. These guys shouldn't be arguing among themselves. This would have been a perfect time if Peter was the first Pope that... Jesus could have reminded him and said, hey, what are you guys talking about here? What are you arguing? Who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to be this? Didn't I pick Peter? Didn't I make him the foundation of the church? Didn't I say he was the one I'm going to build my church upon? I mean, what are you guys talking about? Did you forget already? He doesn't say any of that. He doesn't bring that up because the idea is not there. It's not in Jesus' mind. It's not in any of the apostles' mind. They're all somebody wants a position of superiority and they're arguing over who should get it. So nobody understood Peter as being the supreme pontiff or the pope. Another example, number three, if you're numbering the examples, you go to the Council of Jerusalem. Council of Jerusalem takes place in Acts 15. We find there this great council. And what they're debating at this council is whether Gentile Christians should be circumcised. You got a little bit of, you know, you got the old, you got the law here, they're changing, they're coming unto Jesus Christ. You know, how much of the, uh, how much of this law are we getting away from? The Jews had to do this, do the Gentiles have to do that also? This is, and there was a big riff over it. Do they have to, don't they have to? So they said, let's get together. They all come together at the Council of Jerusalem, and they're going to make a decision on whether the Gentiles need to be circumcised. Now, here's my point. And here's what we need to look at and consider. If Peter was the pontiff of the church, if Peter was the pope, it would certainly be recognized at this council. You're pulling together a council to make a formal decision on doctrine, on belief, on procedures in the church. It was not. Peter is not recognized as having any kind of a superior position, nor does Peter act as if he has any type of a superior position. If you read through it in Acts 15, you'll see here that Peter, he is the one, to give, he gives some input, he gives and, and speaks his mind about what he thinks should be, and then everyone else does too. So does Barnabas, so does Paul, so does James, they all give their input. And a, together, a decision is made by all of them. <clears throat> and as they make the decision, then they write a letter. They write a letter, and then the apostles and the elders and the brethren, verse 23 says, sent out the letter. Now, th that is not how things work if you have a pope. 
the Pope is the head, he heads up the council, he heads the, and they, they may get together and talk about things and discuss things. A decision is made, and then the Pope issues an encyclica. He issues the letter. It comes from the hand of the Pope. This is the official proclamation of Pope Peter. And this is what's going to be binding upon the church. I'm now going to speak ex cathedra. I'm going to speak infallibly. You see none of that here. You see none of that structure here. We see nothing of Peter having a lead position or even issuing the proclamation. Nothing mentioned about Peter having or being the Pope. Sometimes I just repeat it 4,200 times in my mind. But are you grasping here? Okay, let's move on. Number seven. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that Peter was the Pope and that at a certain point in time he went to Rome. And he went to Rome to set up the church there and to move the papacy, I guess from Jerusalem, to move it to Rome. I'm not positive he was moving it from Jerusalem, but he's going to Rome to set up the church and to establish the papacy, the Roman papacy in Rome. Now, here's the question. Peter is supposed to, supposedly to be there in Rome establishing the church. The Catholic Church holds that he was there roughly between 42 and 67 AD for about a period of 25 years that he was there in Rome. This would mean that Peter was there when the Apostle Paul went to Rome. The Apostle Paul went to Rome approximately 60 AD. He sent there as a prisoner. Paul has been arrested they were going to prosecute him, persecute him, prosecute him. He eventually uh, appeals to Caesar. And once he did that, they had to send him down to Rome to see Caesar, Roman citizen. So after a long time, he finally got himself there to Rome in roughly 60 AD. So now we go back to Acts 27. Acts 27 gives very specific details of Paul's journey to Rome. He really breaks it down of when he got there and what happened when he got there. These are the points that we want to look at. There is not a word said by Paul and all that he talks about, about Peter being in Rome. Not a word is said about Peter. So number one question is, why would Peter even go to Rome? Peter is the apostle to the Jews. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. Rome is primarily Gentiles. There are Jews there, but primarily Gentiles. If Peter's the apostle to the Jews and Paul's the apostle to the Romans, why would Peter even be sent there? Galatians 2, 7 and 8. Paul is speaking and he says, When they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcision, that's the Jews, had been committed to me, okay, I'm sorry, to the uncircumcision is the Gentiles. And he's saying, When they saw that the gospel to the Gentiles had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised, or the Jews, was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. That's where he's saying that, Galatians 2. Peter goes to the Jews, I go to the Gentiles. So if the gospel is to the Jews, was given to Peter, and if the gospel to the Gentiles is given to Paul, why does he go to Rome? Why, why would he even be there? Now we're not answering why this is why he went to Rome. The point being, he didn't go to Rome. He wasn't there. Why would Paul even need to go to Rome, let's reverse it, if Peter was there? Now, we know he went there because he appealed to Caesar because he was under arrest. But look what happens. Look what Paul is saying when he writes the book of Romans. Romans 1, 9 through 13. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing... I make mention of you always in my prayers. He's writing to the Roman church. Making request, if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Listen now. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, 
to the end you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and of me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you, also even as among other Gentiles. I want to come to you, to minister to you, to fellowship with you, to have some fruit with you, to build you up and to help you. What, now, I mean, on a personal level, Paul could want to do that, but what is the necessity of that happening if Peter, the Pope, the Supreme Pontiff, is there and has already been there for approximately 15 years? I mean, there's a lot of people to see. Why does he need to go there and to do that and have that desire if, again, Peter is already, already there? Now, let's continue on with this if, if, if Peter was there. Look at the events that after Paul's arrival at Rome. Paul arrives in Acts 28, 16. He arrives there as a prisoner. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. He didn't have to go to the prison. He was kept under house arrest. And then he says, three days later, Paul calls for the Jews of Rome together, to gather together. Acts 28, 17, and it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. Verse 21, then they said to him, he has been asking, did you hear about me and my problems and what's going on with me and what's what? Then they said to him, we neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who came reported or spoken any evil of you. But we desire to hear from you what you think. We want to hear you. For concerning this sect, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. Tell us about Jesus Christ. Tell us about Christianity. We desire to hear this from you. We want to hear this gospel. So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning until evening. All day long he's preaching the gospel to them. And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken, and some did not believe. Now here's the question. Here's the question. Why did Paul need to explain the gospel to the Jews at Rome? If Peter was already there and had been there for 15 years. I don't care, 10 years. I'm not going to get all antsy-pantsy about dates. But he was certainly there at the same time. If the Supreme Pontiff is there, that's like me going to Rome today and saying, hey, I'm desiring to come to you and i got to give you the gospel when the Pope is sitting right there. Wouldn't you think the Pope would give him the gospel? Wouldn't you think he would proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ? And here he's proclaiming it to the Jews. Peter was the one sent to the Jews. Even if he didn't do it through all of Rome, which I would find that very hard to believe, he certainly would have done it to the Jews. So Paul spends two years under house arrest. Let's continue on. Acts 28.30 and Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came into him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concerned the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence and no man forbidding him. Now here's my point. Paul goes on for two more years. Anybody that wants to come see him, he's going to preach the gospel. Paul never mentions Peter. There's not a word. Not a word about Peter. He doesn't mention him as visiting him. He doesn't mention him as the Pope. He doesn't mention him as even being in Rome. If Peter was in Rome establishing the church again, why was Paul the one preaching the gospel? Secondly, thirdly, fourthly, actually fourthly, we see Peter is not with Paul in any way, shape, or form. Listen to this, 2 Timothy 4, 10 and 11 talking about his time, and he says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. Crescens for Galatia, Titus has left me. Only Luke is with me. 
Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful for me for ministry. Here he is. Here's the people that have left him, he says. Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark to help me in ministry. Where's Peter? Where is Peter? He doesn't mention Peter at all. Now, either Paul is being monumentally insulting, which I don't think is what's happening, or Peter's not there. And that's very plain. Only Luke is with me. No, Luke is with me and the Pope. <laughs> Come on. Only Luke is with me and I need some help in the ministry. Now, you don't need to send anybody. I got Peter here. No, send Mark. Because only Luke is with me. I need help. One more, number five. If Peter was there in Rome, he didn't come to Paul's defense. When Paul, remember, he was on trial there. He was a prisoner. Verse 16. Verse 16, 2 Timothy. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but everyone forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Now think about it. Here's Paul. He's on trial. He's on trial for what he believes. If Peter is the Roman pontiff, the head of the church, the supreme pontiff, the pope, if he's there, you don't think he's going to come and stand beside Paul and defend him? Certainly you think he's just going to stay off by himself and say, sorry, Paul, you're on your own. Absolutely not. If Peter is there, he's going to be there. But P Paul says, no one has come to my defense. He's not blaming Peter because Peter isn't there. It's just more evidence that he was not there. So, again, if you sum it up, how could Paul be alone? How could he only be with Luke? How can he say, send Mark to me? If he's coming up for his defense, why would not the very vicar of Christ, the Holy Father, the leader of the entire church, come and stand beside Paul and support him if he was there? If he was there, he would have. The point is, he was not there. It is inconceivable that he would have been there and not done these things. And how do you go through the whole book of, uh, of Romans? How do you go through everything that is here? That's really our next point. All that Paul's done here, and he never once mentions the name Peter. Conclusion, logical conclusion, Peter was never in Rome. Now, the argument isn't so much, you know, did Peter ever show up in Rome? Was he there for a day or two days? That's not the point. The point is the Catholic Church teaches that he is the supreme pontiff, and he went to Rome for 25 years to establish the church and to set up the Roman pontificate there in, in, in Rome. And that's what we're showing here, that that is not the case. It is not the truth. It did not happen. All right, let's move on. Uh, we'll, we'll do our next lesson. We've still got some more points to look at. All right, I trust that this is being a blessing to you, and I would encourage you to continue on in our study. May the Lord bless you.